So I've, I've, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to um, participate in this uh, celebration of uh, Samson's um, um, coming of age. And um, I've known Samson for many years. I was trying to remember when it was that we first met. Um, what I think it was was in, at one of the spring schools in Trieste um, many years ago. I think um, I was having a coffee with Michael Green. We were having a a quiet English conversation, and then Samson arrives and um, this and tr uh, transforms and enlivens the conversation with his usual with his um, characteristic, characteristic combination of stories, anecdotes, um, cr jokes, critiques of. Um, what's going on, or combined with the critique of what's going on in theoretical physics. <coughs> um, I was um, talking um, with one of the other speakers about the difficulty of knowing quite what to say about Samson in, this, in these sort of morning sessions, since there's um, so many great stories of Sam about Samson, but most of which are probably not right for talking about this time in the morning, especially but not when the lecture is being recorded. Um, <coughs> so... Um, but I think it's also, but Samson also has his serious side. And I think it's very good that um, we have a scientific meeting here to recognize um, his many uh, scientific achievements. Um, he's done a great deal of uh, important things. Um, and perhaps it's, it's probably true to say that he hasn't perhaps got the credit he perhaps deserves for many of the things he's done. And it's very good that a lot of the talks here are um, recognizing and remembering some of the things that he's done. I, unfortunately, yet I haven't had um, the pleasure, or if that's the right word, of collaborating with Samson. Uh, but um, we very nearly did. We applied for a grant, research grant together, a joint British-Irish uh, one. Um, so we heard yesterday about um, Conn's criterion that we shouldn't think about um, whether something is mathematics or physics, but only whether it's true or false, whether it's right or wrong. And it seems that. Um, it's not clear what happened, but it seems that um, one of the ju judgments on our grant proposal was that it was um, um, too much physics and not enough mathematics. Um, so, um, but what I want to talk about today is some of the um, some of the um, things which we might have um, got some of the work I've been doing, which might have been part of that collab that collaborative effort involving special holonomy manifolds and related things. Um, s s someone asked me whether the word degeneration in the title had anything to do with Samson. Of course, uh, it doesn't. It's referring to um, uh, um, degeneration of geometries. Um, but of, uh, but, and I thought there was no connection. But then, um, as many of you know, Samson has been involved in uh, an art film project over many years. And I heard, I learned yesterday that two of the films from that project are um, uh, have been uh, nominated for the Berlin Film Festival, and one of them, it turns out, is called Degeneration. So I was wondering if there was any, so not believing that there's not, there can't be a coincidence. I looked to see what it was about, and it was about a a, res, a research a physics research institute uh, where the members there were. Um, involved, were facing what it called an existential crisis and um, being the kind of film that it was um, that resulted in some degeneration and it all ended very badly as far as I can tell but um, uh, I was very uh, relieved to see that although some of our uh, esteemed colleagues were involved in this film it seems that Samson was not part of the degeneration film so I hope that he'll long stay um, free from such uh, existential crises. Um, <coughs> so uh, the work I'm going to talk about was some work I've done, been doing over the last few years with uh, my student, Nipal Chamjamaras. It's taken me a few years to learn to how to begin to pronounce his name. I still haven't got it right. Um, from Thailand. Um, and um, the general theme is understanding uh, relationships between string theory and geometry. Um, uh, we know that we have a picture of string theory as uh, uh, formulated as a perturbation theory, and we know a lot about um, now know a lot about the ingredients involved in that. Um, 
But the dualities we've uh, discovered have revealed um, a, a surprising non-perturbative structure to the theory, still very poorly understood. And, that, um, and there's these duality symmetries which help us understand uh, some of these, um, some of these uh, um, non-perturbative and strong coupling relation, um, generalizations. And what I want to talk to do about today involves some very recent mathematics, which uh, some very interesting uh, recent uh, geometric results, which turn out to shed uh, a great deal of light on uh, some of these dualities. In particular, it gives a, a, a very in, an interesting un relationship between um, some, some of the ingredients in perturbative string theory in, involving brains and orientifolds and related things, and um, and uh, certain um, um, geometric uh, properties. And it, it does it in such a way that it um, immediately lends itself to all sorts of generalizations. And it looks like it's going to be a very profitable way of trying to understand and unravel things both about, um, the perturbati about um, non-perturbative string theory and about geometry. So it's... Um, so the st starting point is the dualities involving K3, and then we'll go on to um, look at um, uh, special holonomy generalizations. And the start and it's now uh, the starting point is the um, the duality between two A strings on K3 and the heterotic or type one string on on a four torus. So it's um, it's in fact it's about 25. It's almost exactly 25 years since. Uh, Paul Townsend and I proposed this duality, um, and it's, it's quite intriguing that there's, although it's a lot of evidence in favour of that, there's still a lot of mysteries, mysteries involved in this. One way of understanding some of this is, is, is um, a standard um, duality argument where, um, is this a, yeah, um, where if you take um, type one string on a four torus, um, then you can, via a chain of um, T and S dualities, you can get to the type 2A string on an orbifold of T4 modded out by a Z2, a four torus modded out, an orbifold of a four torus. And um, this gives us, and this is a special orbifold point of the K3 moduli space. So it gives, um, an exo it gives a proof of the, uh, a derivation of this duality at one particular point in the moduli space of K3. Um, and then one can try and argue um, how to move away from this um, point by understanding how to move away from the, this point in the K3 moduli space and the corresponding moving away from that point in the type 1 theory. And, um, and this is um, quite a fruitful way of doing that, uh, doing, of understanding this. Um, but. Um, one of the problems is, one of the issues which arises in thinking about this directly is that when you move away from this point in the moduli space, there are no longer any isometries and no longer any conventional T dualities to use, so that um, the duality is no longer, can no longer be understood in this um, simple way. And some of the new mathematics I'll be talking about involves um, a particular um, identification of, a, of a, um, a region of the moduli space of K3. Which, um, in which we can um, understand some of this quite explicitly. And <coughs> in particular, the chain of dualities taking um, type 1 to 2A two, two on K3 takes the D brains in, type, in the t um, type 1 theory to the Kaluz Klein monopoles, in the, uh, on the, and, um, and it gives a picture in which the D brains here are represented by Kaluz Klein monopoles monopoles, and I'll be saying a lot more about that. But there are also orientifold planes in the type 1 story, and um, this whole story will lead to um, um, some kind of, should lead to some kind of geometric dual for these orientifold planes. And in this way, um, it will give us a new picture of K3 and a new understanding of orientifold planes at strong coupling and a rather explicit picture of the dualities. As I mentioned, I'll be using um, some new results um, from geometry, but in fact, um, this um, stringy duality picture, um, in, some, in some sense, um, 
predicted, um, could have predicted that there should be this picture of K3, which involved um, the moduli space being understood in terms of positions of, um, K, of Knutskalai monopoles and so on. <coughs> so um, a starting point will be to think about um, type 1 string on a circle. So thinking about um, a, a, a circle across nine-dimensional Minkowski space. Um, if you do a T-duality, um, it replaces the circle by a, um, a circle modded out by Z2. So um, corresponds to reflection in one line, and so there'll be two fixed points. And in this picture, um, in the string theory, we need to, we l one learns that one needs to insert an orientifold plane at these two points. So we're looking at a circle across um, nine-dimensional Minkowski space. So we get a nine-dimensional plane at each of these two points. And because there's this reflection symmetry, we can think about just considering the half, a half of the circle with these at either end. And we have a picture of um, an align interval with an orientifold um, plane at either end. So we're taking the product of this with nine-dimensional Minkowski space. So we can think of this as being a slab with nine-dimensional orientifold planes at the two ends. And we have a picture of this with some um, nine-dimensional D-brains which move um, along this interval. And in fact, there are 16 of these D8 brains in the perturbative theory. And <coughs> um, at strong coupling, this picture is um, modified. There was um, arguments originally by Cyberg and Morrison, which said that there's more, more things which can happen at strong coupling. And instead of having orientifold planes, there's some objects which are referred to as O star planes instead. And um, the, the whole structure is rather mysterious at the, um, in the uh, type 1 theory. But this whole picture should have a, a dual uh, representation in um, the dual K3 th theory. And in particular, if we take the case where we have this interval being very long compared to various other scales in the theory, we should expect um, a picture of K3 which has got a long neck. And that's... So we have some long neck, a four-dimensional space with some long neck region, the various um, divided into various segments. And these are joined together by various um, bubbles which involve um, insertions of Klutzerklein monopoles. And I'll be more precise about how this works in a, in, uh, as we go on. And these positions of these Klutzerklein monopoles uh, will be dual to the positions of these D8 brains. And this being a smooth geometry, um, it, there must be some kind of smooth hypercalar cap which goes on these ends. And um, one of the things we'll be talking about is um, what these um, caps are, what these geometries are. And it turns out there's an intriguing relationship between these and del Pezzo surfaces. And that these, uh, and that the um, the, the rather limited classification of these um, has um, a, lot of in, uh, a lot of implications for the, cor for the dual string theory. So um, this is the sort of picture we might have expected from string duality. And as I'll explain, um, in 2018, a, a very precise um, construction of, a, of a, um, metrics on, a, on K3 in a limit in which it degenerate, the metric degenerates to something which is uh, has got a long, thin neck of this kind, was constructed, and has precisely this kind of structure. And this whole story leads itself to further directions. Um, one thing I'll say a little bit about is um, um, the very interesting generalization to special holonomy where um, this picture in terms of brains gets related, gets generalized to one involving intersecting brains. And one of the nice things about this story is it's um, dualizing the type 1 prime gives a consistent string configuration for various brains that can't exist in isolation. If one starts off dualize, dualizing D brains, one ends up with various, um, as one gets to um, D7 brains and D8 brains, one's already familiar with um, 
the fact that they, you, these don't exist well on isolation and you need to, uh, to take into account their back reaction and uh, putting them in, in a consistent string background, for example, in the type 1 primed, as we've discussed. Um, if formally one takes further dualities, it leads to um, various br things which have been referred to as exotic brains in low co-dimension. And again, these don't exist in isolation, uh, but this chain of this chains of dualities, starting from the one we've just been, I'll, I'll be concentrating on in this talk, gives rise to um, um, consistent backgrounds for these to live in. Uh, and in particular, it takes the K3 to, non, to certain non-geometric backgrounds, T-folds and related things. And then the, the picture of, um, and then we have a picture of, um, instead of K3, uh, instead of K3 and being understood in terms of Knuth's Klein monopoles living in this background geometry, we understand it in now in terms of um, exotic brains in terms of T-fold, in a T-fold background. So, um, so let me, um, now um, start talking in more, a little more detail about some of the ingredients which go into this. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, a torus bundle with a duality twist. So for example, having a two torus, for example, fibred over a circle. Um, um, for a, for a, for a geomet if we're constructing a geometric bundle, we could look at a bundle where the, um, the monodromy around this circle involved a large diffeomorphism of this two torus. But in string theory, we can generalize this, and we can think about having a, conf a two torus conformal field theory here, and we can look about look at having a monodromy around here, which is an automorphism of this conformal field theory. In other words, a, a, a duality, um, a T duality transformation, which for a D torus would be in this group, and for a two torus, um, the, um, you get O22Z, which has got an SL2Z cross SL2Z subgroup. And this subgroup acts on two moduli of this two torus. One is the complex structure modulus for the two torus. The other is the, um, the complex modulus given by the value of the B field on this two torus, the constant value of the B field, plus I times the area of this um, two torus. Um, so this, um, these are both symmetries of, this, um, of the conformal field theory. If we, had a mo if we had a monodromy which is in um, the SL2Z acting on tau, we construct a geometric bundle. Um, if we had one which involved the full group, then we'd construct something more general, uh, um, a torus bundle with a duality twist. So is it not a T2 group, it's S special orthogonal, is it? Um, so if in the bosonic string it's um, ODDZ, in the superstring it would be more properly SO. No, it's a bosonic one. Um, so I, I'm not being very precise here, so there'll be a slightly different story um, depending on whether I was do, looking at the bosonic or the superstring. And, um, and then there's, uh, in either case, there's an SL2Z cross SL2Z subgroup, but there's a question about whether I need to divide this by an, a Z2, and I'm not going to um, be very precise about those sorts of features in this talk. But... Um, so, for the purposes of the next couple of slides, let's think in terms of the bosonic group where I can keep, put everything in O22Z and, and everything fits. Um, for the superstring, I would have to um, be slightly more restrictive. So, um, a simple case is where we take um, the, a, a case where the product is topologically just a three torus, um, but we have a B field which depends linear. Uh, which is proportional to the volume form dy by wedge dz on the two torus and uh, depends linearly on the coordinate x around this circle. Um, so this is so the curvature of this two form, the exterior derivative will just be the three volume of this um, of the three torus. And there's a monodromy here for the modulus rho as you go around this circle because b shifts by uh, m times the volume form. If we take a T duality, um, we get um, a two torus, we turn off the B field and get a two torus bundle over a circle, and we get a manifold which is referred to as a, often referred to as a nil fold, which has got, um, which is a two torus, which could be, which is a two torus bundle over a circle, 
but it can also be viewed as a circle bundle over T2 with this metric and there's a monodromy, um, a geometric monodromy in which the complex structure sh uh, modulus shifts by an integer m here. And if we take one further t duality, we end up with something, we get a metric and a B field, which look fine until you remember that x is meant to be periodic. Um, and um, these are not periodic metrics or B fields, but it turns out that there's a monodromy which involves a t duality transformation as you go around this circle the metric and the B field come back to each other related by the action of an O2 to Z transformation, which acts non in a, a complicated nonlinear way on, these, on, these, um, uh, on this geometry. Um, but because this is a symmetry of the, uh, an automorphism of the two torus conformal field theory, this is still a good um, string theory compact um, construction. So this gives a nice um, uh, duality orbit of um, of geometries, which is often often discussed, but there's an issue in that none of these can, are solutions of the string the of string theory. For example, the three torus with flux doesn't satisfy the um, equations of motion, doesn't define a conformal field theory. But nonetheless, one can find one can embed look at these in string theory by looking for bundle solutions in which these are, these geometries arise as fibers, and then the duality transformations act as fiber-wise duality on these, um, in, in this construction. And the simplest case is where I take these three geometries fibered over a line. And in particular, the case where we have the nilfold um, fibered over a line um, gives, a, it gives a construction which in, admits a hypercalar metric. So this metric can be understood as a, uh, as a kind of Jim Gibbons Hawking uh, metric. So as will be familiar to most of you, um, the Gibbons Hawking metric is a four dimensional Kähler Ricci flat or hyper Kähler mat mat metric, which is um, given as a, um, a circle bundle over uh, an R3, which is um, where you have th R3 with um, these coordinates. And we have a circle fiber with coordinate Y. And um, we have um, V being a harmonic function on R3 and um, omega satisfying this equation. And we, if we allow the harmonic function to have delta function sources at some points, we have a circle bundle of R3 with some points removed. And remarkably, um, this is regular at the sources of these, um, of this um, harmonic, uh, the sources Ri of these things, if m equals one, and this gives a multi tailed nut space, and there are simple orbifold singularities for m greater than one. So, um, in this way, we construct um, um, a, th a, a metric over the whole of R3, not just on R3 with the points removed. So, one way of um, put, what, so part of the ingredients will be looking at trying to put this on a torus. So we can um, think about um, so-called smeared solutions, where we take this harmonic function on R3 and choose the potential to be independent of one or more coordinates. And the coordinates which it's independent of, we can then choose to be periodic and, um, uh, and can be periodically identified. Um, so for example, um, if we used to smear on X and Y, we take V to be a harmonic function just of tau with X and Z independent of x and um, z, so I th that y should be a z. Um, then we have a harmonic function in one variable, which is just a linear function, or a piecewise linear function, where we can allow there to be a, a kink at, um, say, tau equals zero, where there's a, um, a jump in the gradient. And we can think of this as giving a domain wall um, which is a two-plane dividing the transverse three-space, three-dimensional space into two parts for tau bigger and less than zero. And the difference between m and m primed can be thought of as being associated with the energy density or the tension of, the, of this domain wall. So this is a very nice construction, but one of the disadvantages is the metric one constructs this way is typically singular, and that's something we're going to have to deal with that, deal with. So let's look at the um, smeared Gibbons Hawking metric where we take um, this um, linear potential. Then we, if we, we get this metric and if we notice that if we take a look at it for uh, fixed tau, 
um, the metric becomes precisely the kind of nilfold we were talking the nilfold metric we were talking about before, which is a circle bundle over T two, with um, um, representative of the first Chern class given by um, this two form, and m is required to be an integer. And this can be thought of as a quotient of the group manifold of the Heisenberg group by a uh, discrete subgroup. So here we have a picture of um, a nilfold fibred over a line, the line parameterized by um, tau, and there are domain walls um, at the places where the, um, the um, gradient jumps here and uh, the um, and so we have um, a, a set of domain walls um, um, separating these uh, nil folds uh, this um, nil folds um, this nil fold bundles over a line and to get a string solution we take a product of this with six dimensional Minkowski space getting a ten dimensional metric and this could be thought of as a metric for a smeared kaluz klein monopole. With the original Taub-Nut metric, it's precisely the, what's referred to as a kaluz klein monopole metric. And now we can look at the t-dualities. Um, if we take um, the nilfold fibred over a line, we've got um, three circular directions, um, the x, y, and z directions. And we can look at um, t-dualizing in any of those. So if we um, t dualize in this coordinate, the one of the um, circle of the fiber of the circle fiber, um, the y coordinate, we end up with a metric which is um, conformally flat. It undoes the topological twist but turns on a B field, and we end up with a, a, th a three form uh, H given in this way. So we get um, uh, a, a conformally flat space but with um, the conformal factor given by this uh, piecewise linear uh, potential. The ten-dimensional solution is that we take the product with Minkowski space, and this is the metric for um, a nervous Schwartz five brain uh, smeared over the three directions x, y, and z, uh, which are then identified to give a transverse space instead of it being a transverse space being R4, it's R cross T3. And we could do a further duality and get a T-fold fibred over a line. Um, and, um, but I won't um, say a lot about that today. This generalizes straightforwardly to having a multi-domain wall solution where having a, p a general piecewise linear function with kinks at a set of points tau i and with a domain wall um, with um, energy density given by the jumps at each of these points. And, um, and it it's, it was, uh, it's also interesting to know that you can also think about single-sided domain walls. If we have this linear potential, this is invariant under reflection tau to minus tau, and if we quotient by this reflection, this gives um, a solution just for positive tau, and you could think of there being a single-sided domain wall at the point at the boundary tau equals zero. So. These are going to be some of the ingredients we're going to look at, um, but these are, as it stands, these are not um, consistent string backgrounds. Uh, away from the domain walls, we get to have a hyperscalar space, which is a good solution, and the duals um, also give conformal field theories away from the, those, but, there are do, but the domain walls are singular. And um, the linear dilaton and the potential typically, and the potential V typically blow up um, unless um, we end it with uh, single-sided domain walls. And when we do that, we will need some negative brain charges to give total net zero charge to get a consistent solution. So to understand this, what to do about this, um, we can use the chain of dualities I mentioned in the introduction. So um, we started off with a smeared kaluza klein monopole um, taking the potential function to be independent of two, a number of object, a number of directions, we could then um, compactify on the. We could take those directions to be periodic, and then we could t-dualize, and we end up with a Nova Schwartz five brain smeared on T three. We could then dualize this to s-dualize this to a D five brain, and then t-dualize to get a D eight brain wrapped on this same T three. And this same chain of dualities will take the nilfold fibered over a line. Um, 
to a T3 with flux fibred over a line, and then we end up here with a D8 brain, um, which is this domain wall in 9 plus 1 dimensions. And the D8 brains um, don't uh, to exist in a string background, we need to introduce orientifold planes. Um, in particular, we need uh, the consistent string background is the type 1 prime string I've mentioned, which has an interval with um, orientifold planes at the two ends and 16 D8 brains moving bet be between that. And in this case, the singularities um, which occur at the domain walls reflect the presence of, presence of physical objects, which we know occur in string theory, the D8 brains. Um, and when we dualize to get consistent backgrounds for the nil fold, the T fold and the T3 with H flux, um, there should be, uh, we should be getting duals of the D brains and the orientifold planes. And there's questions about how these singularities are resolved. In particular, um, when we, by the time we get to the kluts klein monopole, there shouldn't be um, physical, um, physical objects represented by the, dual by the singularities in the way that the D brains were, but instead we should be getting smooth geometries. So understanding how to resolve all this will tell us something about the kind of smooth geometries which should be dual to these various objects. So a bit more precision about the type 1 prime theory. Uh, we have 16 D8 brains, each of charge plus 1 in my units. Um, they can be arranged so there's Ni at a set of points tau i, so that the total number is um, 16. And we have two orientifold planes of each of charge minus 8 at the two endpoints tau equals 0 and pi. And then the metric away from, uh, the, the supergravity metric corresponding to this co configuration has got, is of the kind we've been talking about. Um, it's this form, um, nine, so it's have nine dimensional Minkowski space and then fibered over this line with parameter tau. And um, if we have um, a number of, um, if we have a number of um, the D brains coincident with the orientifold plane, we get, if you have n minus coincident with um, the orientifold plane here, we get charge minus 8 plus n minus and minus 8 plus n plus here. And um, the total number of brains in the middle will then be uh, given by the sum of b minus and b plus, which will be less than or equal to 16. So now we look at the chain of dualities we've talked about. Um, we can first of all think about dualizing the supergravity solution, wrapping on T3 to get um, the smeared Gibbons Hawking or Nova Schwartz 5 brain uh, that we've talked about. And the 16 sources will then become Klutz Klein monopole or Nova Schwartz 5 brain sources smeared over this T3. And the, the issue is understanding how these singularities should be resolved. And at the ends of the interval, there should be duals of the 08 planes, which again should be somehow uh, geometric. And so the, the chain of dualities we've talked about is starting off with the D8 brain going T-dualizing to a D5 brain, <coughs> S-dualizing to a Nova Schwartz 5 brain, T-dualizing to a Klutz Klein monopole, and then maybe dualizing further to uh, one of these exotic brains, which I mentioned. And so um, the chain of dualities on the orientifolds has been understood for the first few steps. The O8 plane goes to an O5 plane. The S dual of this has been referred to as an ON plane in the literature. But then one of the questions is, what happens if we try and look at the further dualities? What do we get here? What are the, uh, in particular, there should be something geometric arising here. Uh, and, and the analog of the fact that we have a geometry which is dual to these brains arising here. So looking at the full string theory, we start off with um, the type 1 prime string theory on um, which, um, or the type 1 on a circle across nine dimensional Minkowski space, which is T dual to the type 1 primed on um, this orbifold S1 mod Z2 across nine dimensional Minkowski space. And then we can compactify both sides on a three torus and do the chain of dualities we've talked about. So the type 1 prime can be thought of as the 2B string theory identified under the operation omega, which, reflect, which ref, um, is uh, orientation reversing on the world sheet. Um, and then we get the 2A theory, the type 1 prime is the 2A theory modded out by reflection in the ninth coordinate together with um, 
which is the circle coordinate together with this orient orientifold. T dualizing, we get the 2B modded out by the Z2, which involves reflection in um, four directions and an orient orientifold. Uh, the S dualizing, we place the, this by minus one to the left handed Fermi number. And then T dualizing again, we get a geometric orbifold with the 2A on T4 modded out by this geometric Z2, which is the, an orbifold limit of the K3. And so we understand, as, uh, so this is the understanding of the duality between the type 1 on T4 and the 2A on K3 at this point in moduli space. And so we have um, the corresponding um, transformations of the various brains that we've talked about, it, the brains in the various series, starting off with the nine brains in the type 1 theory. And the brains become gravitational solitons. And one of the issues is what happens to the orientifold planes in this limit. So dualizing the supergravity solution with um, D8 brains to one with kluts klein monopoles, we end up with a space which is the nilfold fiber over a line with smeared kluts klein monopoles. And at the ends of the line interval, we get some sort of geometric dual of the orientifold planes. And um, this is the same set of dualities which we get from dualizing the type 1 prime string, which takes it down to 2a on k3. So this is an argument which predicts there should be a region of the k3 moduli space where the k3 looks like this picture I drew here, where we have um, a long neck regions, which are the nilfold fibered over a line. And um, there are jumps in the degree of the nilfold, the integer m characterizing the bundle, and at these jumps, there'll be regions which have kluts klein monopoles. And, there'll be, and at the ends, there'll be um, geometries at the ends of the interval, which look like the duals of the O8 planes. And this prediction was um, very safe to make because just such a limit, degenerate limit of K3, which looks just like this, was constructed uh, in 2018 by Hein, Sun, Vyakovsky, and Zhang. They constructed um, uh, uh, precisely a, a family of K3 metrics dependent on a limit GT, such that in the limit T equals zero, um, it, it collapses to a line interval. So it's constructing a geometry which has got a long neck region for small tau. So we're looking at um, a particular um, region of the moduli space of K3 near, the boundary, near a boundary. <coughs> and each set, the, the neck is split into segments, each of which is a nilfold fibred over a line. And the nilfold, it, the nilfold is, as I mentioned, is the circle bundle over tau 2 characterized by its degree or churn number. And different values of this integer will arise at different um, segments with insertion of gravitational instantons or uh, kluts klein monopoles at, these, at, the plate, at the junctions. And the ends are capped by spaces which were um, constructed by Tian and Yao, which are, uh, I'll be saying more about in a moment, but these are complete non-compact hypercalar manifolds, which are precisely <coughs> have the right asymptotics to, join, to glue onto here. In other words, asym the asymptotic region is a nilfold fibred over a line, precisely this kind of geometry. So here's a picture of um, what this looks like from their paper. Here there's a case where we've just have one bubble in the middle where we have all the kluts klein monopoles at these points here. We have smooth caps at the end. And, um, and um, the, the metric is in fact constructed using um, each of the ingredients um, ha is a smooth hypercalar manifold. There's, I've talked about the nilfold fibered over a line. Uh, the Tian Yao spaces are precise hypercalar manifolds. And uh, we'll be talking a bit more about the metrics, the kluts klein met monopole metrics here. And uh, the, the hard part of the mathematical analysis was showing that you could glue these together in such a way as to construct a smooth, compact, hypercalar metric, in other words, a K3 metric. So the first approximation to their metric is precisely the one which I've been constructing from these supergravity solutions. Away from these domain walls, you have um, this kind of geometry. And the way they resolve these, um, the singularities is that the um, 
at the end point, the, the single-sided domain walls at the end, we resolve with the Tian-Yau spaces, and um, at the, um, the jumps points, the tau i, it's resolved using um, um, a Guri buffer construction of um, the, using the Guri buffer construction for hypercada uh, for Klitschkoi monopoles. So um, the idea here is, if you look at the Gibbons Hawking metric replaced by R cross T two, the first approximation would be to smear over T two. But better, you could take um, a slot on R3, take a periodic array of sources in a two, in a two plane, and construct uh, a sum of potentials, which is singular, which, but it could be regularized to give a good harmonic function. And then when you've got a periodic array, you can, take, you can periodically identify to get a single source solution on R cross T2. Um, and near the source, it's non-singular and looks like a Taub nut um, construction. And um, one of the and this all works fine, except one of the tricky points is that because of the regularized sum, the solitons are only regular the, the solutions are only regular on a finite interval in R. Um, if you try and extend it beyond that, then the potential V, which we talked about, becomes negative and the um, s signature flips. So we resolve um, the Gibbons Hawking metric by uh, an Aguri buffer metric on R cross T2 um, with a monopole charge N. And so these will be, these bumps in the middle will be the, precisely these um, um, Guri buffer type solutions. Near the, near the sources, we, it looks like an N-center multi tau nut um, solution. Um, and um, if we have coincident ones, we get an orbifold singularity. And um, in this way, we get, um, a, fine, we get a consistent uh, hypercalar metric on some interval in this region here. And, far enough, and so um, each, of these, um, do, each of these kinds of metrics only works for a finite domain. And the, and the hard part is showing that these can be glued together. So let me say a little bit about the Tianyel spaces which arise at the endpoints. These are, these are complete, non-singular, non-compact hypercalar spaces asymptotic to a nilfold over, fibered over a line. And these are constructed from so-called del pezzo surfaces by um, subtracting, by cutting out um, it's what's essentially a two-torus, more precisely a smooth anti-canonical divisor. And on this um, space here, one can Tian and Yao had um, an, a, a, an existence proof of the existence of um, metrics of this kind. So just like the um, Calabial story, it's, it's an existence proof rather than a construction. The Del Pezzo surfaces are complex algebraic surfaces characterized by their degree, um, which can run from 1 to 9. Um, for degree 9, it's CP2. Um, a degree for degree B, it's given by blowing up nine minus B points in CP2, and there's a second one of degree eight, which is CP1 <coughs> cross CP1, and this is, gives a complete classification of um, the del pezzo surfaces and hence of these um, uh, Tianyao spaces. So the Tianyao space uh, is constructed from the del pezzo surface of degree B, and it's asymptotic to a to precisely to a nilfold nil where the degree of the del pezzo becomes the degree of the nilfold. And we can extend this to degree zero by taking, by considering the case where M is uh, what's referred to as a, na uh, a rational elliptic surface. And in, in that case, the, um, the nilfold just becomes a three torus, it becomes untwisted. And we get um, the cylindrical, the, we get a region, the, the, the cylindrical region will just be R cross T3, and we get um, an asymptotically, um, we get a, a cylinder T3 cross R in that way. So we take, um, so we resolve the singularities here with um, a Gruy buffer metrics at, the, um, at these domain walls, and at the endpoints we introduce um, Tian Yao spaces. The degree of the Tianyao spaces goes up to nine because of the classification of the um, 
uh, of the Del Pezzo surfaces, so that in the charges of the um, insertions of the klutz klein monopoles have charges up to 18. Uh, this almost agrees entirely with the type 1 prime picture, but instead, but whereas the type 1 prime, we got, there were 16 D8 brains, here we get 18 instead of 16. So um, we're finding this um, almost precise agreement from what we'd have expected from duality, apart from the fact that we get 18 instead of 16 here. And the resolution um, is, as I mentioned in the introduction, is that this is this the idea that you have 16 D8 brains is correct at weak coupling uh, for the perturbative type one prime theory, but uh, at strong coupling, uh, it turns out that an O8 plane can emit one D8 brain to leave a new kind of plane of charge minus nine, the so-called O8 star plane. So then, with at strong coupling, this would give a picture of the type one prime where you had O8 star. Um, planes at either end and 18 D8 brains uh, on the interval or we could have some of them, uh, some of the brains co coinciding with the O8 star planes. And then we get exactly the same equations as we get for the um, degenerate K3 and both cases have 18 sources and this allows for, ex and these 18 sources are, allowed, are needed to allow for some of the gauge symmetries which we know, um, from, for example, from the heterotic dual should arise here. For example, the possibility of SU18 gauge symmetry. So if we look at um, matching the moduli spaces uh, now, um, we see that um, the type 1 prime moduli space is given by this coset. Um, which has got 16 D8 brain positions, um, a, a, the value of the diloton and the length of the um, circle or the interval. And after um, dualizing, this gives an embedding of this type 1 prime moduli space in the moduli space of K3, um, which is, of course, a much bigger metric uh, moduli space. And <coughs> Um, we can, in particular, we can understand um, the moduli spaces as, um, in this way. So, for example, if we look at the orientifold of 2b on T4 mod Z2, which arises as um, one of the duals, um, we, to understand how T4 mod Z2 um, looks like a, a long interval, um, or in other words, what this T4, this K3 looks like in this, uh, in the, um, as a dual of how, how this moduli space is embedded in the moduli space of the K3. We can parameterize um, T4 mod Z2. We can regard this as T3 cross an interval, um, where at the ends of the interval, we identify the three, tor the three torus at the ends by Z2. So we have a long neck which looks like, where if we take the interval to be long, we have a long neck which looks like T3 cross I, cross the interval, but the ends pinch off to, to um, get um, this um, restriction. And then the moduli come from the positions of brains on this um, picture. And um, if we then dualize one further, we get a picture of the K3 with a long neck cross the dual of this T3, which is, becomes the nil fold and we get the moduli from the positions of the klutz klein monopoles. So we see that the duality between the heterotic or type 1 on T4 or, and 2A on K3 um, are understood as T and S dualities at the orbifold point, but not at general points in the K3 moduli space. It doesn't extend there because there are no isometries. However, the matching the moduli spaces of the two theories means that we can understand how, what the corresponding duals are um, and the duality at one point in the moduli space formally leads to a duality at all points. And in particular, we can un translate moving in the type 1 prime moduli space into moving in the uh, 2A moduli space in this way. Um, how much time do I have? Um, we start with maybe three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So I'll s say a little bit about the non-geometric generalizations. Um, there's a generalization where we replace the three-dimensional nilfold with a higher dimensional nil manifold, which instead of being a circle bundle over a two torus becomes a TN bundle over a T over a torus bundle over a torus. And rather remarkably, it was um, shown um, 
from supergravity arguments by Gibbons et al. that if you take certain bundles of this kind, fibre them over a line, just like we fibred the nilfold over a line, you can get not a, K, not a, 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 a K, hyperkähler metric, but a special holonomy metric on this space. And one of the and with, with my student, we looked at this structure and looked at what happens under duals of this, and we found that these special holonomy metrics dualized instead of two Nova Schwartz five brains uh, or Kaluz Klein monopoles, instead to intersecting Nova Schwartz five brains or the corresponding intersections of Kaluz Klein monopole solutions. So the kinds of bundles we get um, which arise in this way, the, the simplest ones are these which give rise to these kinds of holonomies, including G2 and spin 7, as well as Calabi L. Um, so, <coughs> looking at the um, chains of dualities, we took the, the, what we've been talking about was based on the duality between the Taub nut or the Gibbon or the um, Klutz Klein monopole and the Nova Schwartz 5 brain and uh, the corresponding multi um, source uh, generalizations of these. Um, <coughs> so we showed that, uh, with uh, my student, we showed that the special holonomy metrics of Gibbons et al. Um, t dualized to intersecting five brain solutions with one function. And uh, <coughs> it was then for, uh, very straightforward to generalize this in such a way that there was a different harmonic function for each of the intersecting five brains. And then this in turn gave rise to a special a generalization of these special holonomy metrics with several functions, um, all of which were um, involved were highly smeared over many directions. But we also know from the intersecting five brains, intersecting brain story that there's um, these can be these we can do a little better and go f explicitly to semi-local solutions. Um, and this gives rise to, using that same generalization here gives some semi-local construction of uh, special holonomy metrics. And um, the full story will be uh, understanding the relationship between fully localized intersections here, which would then give rise um, to um, special holonomy metrics here. And um, one, uh, one of the, th and one of the, um, and what we're still working on is trying to understand this um, duality further. And in particular, there's a possibility that just like we constructed a complete compact hyperkähler metric for, K, for a degenerate limit of K3, that there could be, uh, there's a prospect of um, uh, compact special holonomy spaces arising in this way from these intersecting brain solutions in a way which again um, would be, uh, again it's something which is formally seems to be predicted by these dualities. And it would be very interesting to understand in detail whether this works and whether this could be used um, explicitly. And then one of the um, nice features about this picture is that we have a very explicit model geometries for these different regions of this space. And because um, the in individual regions, apart from the endpoints, we understand um, they have isometries, we can explicitly do T dualities and other dualities for the model geometries which are glued together um, in this full metric. And so we can go some way to understanding um, the effects of string dualities, at least at this, um, in, in some detail, at least at this region of the moduli space. And, it, and in each case it gives pic uh, a picture which is consistent with what we'd expect from our understanding of string theory. Um, it's also intriguing that um, del pezzos are arising here in an interesting way. And um, it's also intriguing that del pezzos have been um, invoked as um, having structures which are dual to many, which seem to reflect many other um, structures which arise in string theory, um, in particular relations to u-duality. But um, the chairman's standing up, so I'll just um, quickly come to the conclusions. Um, the nil I've talked about the nilfold and its dual giving local um, solutions uh, by fi of string theory fibering over type 1, uh, fibering over an interval. Dualizing gives uh, full string, th dualizing type 1 prime shows how to incorporate these into full string theory solutions. And it gives an interesting uh, realization of K3 at a particular degenerate limit as a nilfold fibered over an interval with Knutz Klein monopole insertions and Tianyao 
end caps. And it's a very interesting approximate geometry for K3 that allows explicit duality transformations in an interesting way. Um, and, we, and we see that um, the, some of the non-perturbative effects of orientifolds like the OH star planes, now after these S dualities become perturbative uh, aspects of the dual geometry in type 2A, and we can understand um, that the O8 uh, in the type 2A picture, the O8 star and the, uh, and the normal orientifold planes are very much on the same footing. <laughs> and it's um, and the, and it's lit, led to a lot of int some interesting ongoing work involving generalizations of special holonomy manifolds and to uh, non-geometric duals to all of this story. Um, but that's um, for the future, and I'll stop here and um, once again wish Samson a happy birthday. So, uh, the, this new uh, holds, uh, T4 mod G2 for special holonomy is basically replaced by Joyce's orbital construction, or it's rather this is similar to Kovalev's. No, so, so these don't seem to be related to the Joyce construction, but it seems to be giving other con related to other constructions, which are um, looking much more like um, duels of intersecting brains. And, um, and there are two types of constructions <coughs> right now. One is Joyce's, and another like eight years later by Kovalev. Yeah. The, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not pronouncing. No, I, I, you're probably pronouncing it better than I am, but uh, I would, yeah, yeah. But I think it would be very interesting to understand um, that kind of question more fully. I, so the, sh the short answer is I don't know, but I think that's that kind. Of, uh, there ought to be. Um, I mean, looking for the orbifold, po the analogs of the or orbifold point T four mod Z two in this story. Is a is a very natural place to try and understand these dualities, and then. Z two square yes. was for uh, yeah. Joyce, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it it was almost like T four mod Z two fiber over another T three, right? Yeah. No, singularities were always Coomer. Yeah. In Joyce case. Yeah. So my impression, although I'm not an expert on this, I haven't looked at this in detail, is that these seem to be corresponding to different orbital points, which is which is one of the things which makes it quite interesting. Any other questions? Yeah, just a quick, on one of the early slides you had this, you mentioned this blowing up of the metric and the linear dilaton. Yeah. So what does it mean that the linear dilaton blows up? Um, so for example, if you looked at the type one prime theory, um, without putting on these, uh, if you just looked at um, a single, a uh, couple of D8 brains without the orientifold planes, then you'd find that the dilaton would be increasing um, uh, would be going off to infinity somewhere, and that would mean that um, in those regions you wouldn't have a perturbative string theory, and you wouldn't really know how to deal with that. So it's no longer linear then. Um, so if you've got a, a non-constant dilaton, you can always choose a coordinate so the dependence is linear. So, oh, so it's um, so it depends which coordinates is, it's linear in some in one coordinate system. But not in yeah, um, but it means that the perturbative picture is not. Um, is not um, is not valid, and so you might look for a hajava witten type construction or some some other kind of construction to try and understand that. So you just want precision regarding when instead of having say T three fiber to the, uh, having the flux with something or having nil poles, when you have this generalization of multiple nil poles, which you say T dualized to the intersect and NS fives, which in turn generate the whole KK monopole sector. Do you, do you have view dualities in this case, or is it possible to, to, to construct a transformation which would lead to what, what would be your dual of such construct when you have a collection of n faults? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, in, in the, um, so all of this story has um, various view duality um, generalizations. So I talked about the case where we had, um, where we used um, combinations of S and T dualities, which could be thought of as giving a U duality, but we could certainly, there's questions about um, stories ab about more general U duality transformations. One of the problems is that in a lot of these more other duals, there are things where we don't understand the, a, a perturbative string theory formulation, and so it's, it's harder to make um, progress there. 
Um, but um, but I think that's a very good question for the future. Yeah. Sorry, I missed I miss something there. Yeah. If yeah. there are no more questions, yeah. I guess we break for 